Hi, and welcome to the Silva Methods Vital Mind Project, where we bring you the best from global experts in the Silva Method. You will get incredible experiences in mental acuity, mindfulness, dynamic meditation, and happiness. I'm Sarah Lee, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's program, where we'll be talking about focusing intuition for a breakthrough life. I'm really excited about this topic because we will be learning to discern the difference from wishful thinking, fear-based thinking, and intuition, as well as develop 12 focusing principles to awaken, refine, and develop your inner wisdom. Also, we'll be learning to overcome the distortions for clear and more reliable intuition. Today's guest is all the way from Connecticut, Massachusetts. He's been teaching the Silva Method for over 40 years and is best known as the Silva Method's Director of Instructor Training. He's here to share his special insight in intuition and how we can use intuition for a breakthrough life. I'm happy to welcome Ken Kosha. Hi, Ken, and welcome to the program. Hi, Sarah Lee. Thank Hi. you very much for having me here. It's such a pleasure to have you. It's always so much fun to talk to you. And it's really crazy because you've been teaching the Silva Method for over 40 years, like I mentioned. That's a really long time. And with so many dynamic aspects of the Silva Method, why do you feel that developing our intuition is so important? Well, I could go on for more time than we have. Although we're interested in relaxation and personal development and self-improvement and all those wonderful things, intuition is perhaps the single most important, in my opinion, single most important quality attribute for people to have in their lives. Why? Because we make decisions every day of our life, picking a partner, picking a, a, an investment to make, picking a neighborhood to live in, choosing a school for our children. And how do we know that we don't always have all the information? We don't always have all the facts. Even in business, it's become increasingly more relevant. And it's interesting, even the research, because not just with investments, but people are constantly making decisions, interviewing, working with clients. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And, and often we just don't have all the facts and we don't know for sure. I mean, because we do need objectivity. We do need our logic. We do need our intellect. When we can add intuition as a piece, it gives us that much more of an edge to be that much more effective. So <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about how people, our listeners, can develop their intuition and how does it exactly can they make it work for them? Well, what we want to cover today in the interview, is, as time allows, and, and please be advised, I say this to you and the listeners, that you know, typically in our classes, we, go, we can go much more in depth and detail, and it's more experiential. What we can do today, though, is I want to take a look at these 12 principles. I call them focusing principles for breakthrough intuition. It's based on my years of study. It's based on my years of experience. And also looking at other intuitives or people who become very prominent, if you will, in life. Because basically... Just like you, Sarah Lee, we all have this intuitive ability. Even neuroscientists say that there's a part of the brain that we have that. It's just that we haven't had a lot of support in the past from our community, from our family, from our society in general. So for, for many people, it's dormant, just waiting, like a, like a sleeping giant, if you will, waiting. So what we can do today is we're going to take a look at these principles, and I'm going to recommend our listeners to take some notes I'm going to recommend that, that they then begin to apply it as a skill and how to refine. So just like you, Sarah Lee, when you start having those feelings, those perceptions, and you get feedback that you're on the money, that becomes a point of reference. And it's a point of reference that begins to build confidence. So part of our, my intention here is to help people have more of, of a, of a a certainty, a higher level of certainty and confidence so that you get to the point that you know what you know and that in turn will help you to trust it more. That's incredible. That's one of the most important things that I learned was being able to develop that confidence once you know, you know, and once you're able to 
tell when your intuition is guiding you, you can forever tell that your intuition is guiding you. And I think that is truly amazing. So do you want to start with the 12 focusing principles to awaken, refine, and develop your inner wisdom? Yes. And what, I'm going to, what I'll do is, um, for, for clarity's sake, is we'll go through these principles. I'll spend more time with some that I feel are really priority, you know, top, where people will get the most immediate benefit. And then what we'll look and, and filter in while I'm doing that is the distortions. Because a question that seems to be in everybody's mind that I've heard in all my years, how do I know I'm not just making this up? How do I know I'm not just wishfully thinking? Or on the other hand, how do I know I'm not just in fear and worrying about something may happen? And this is not something you can really read in a book, and I want to be very clear about that. There are a lot of great books on intuition, some well-respected authors. They write beautifully. Their stories are inspiring. And yet, the only thing that really will make the difference for you, for me, for each of us, is to have our own journal, if you will, our own inner journal, an actual physical journal of experiences like what you mentioned before so that we begin to recognize the distinctions. And that's what I want to ask you, Sara Lee, and, and our listeners to really pay, as we go through this, to pay attention to some of those distinctions that you'll start to remember as we go through. So that being said, may I begin with just a couple of quick quotes that I think are relevant to just kind of frame this? Absolutely. Go right ahead. One of them is a quote that I came up with some time ago in um, actually 1986 when Jose Silva was alive, your, your granddad, who was a friend and a mentor and who really saw in me things that I didn't see in myself and was instrumental in me starting. We were, it's always been his mission to awaken intuition, to develop it since the mid-50s when he recognized he was onto something of more value than memory. And with his blessings, I began, I put together a workshop that we call the Lost Sense or Intuition in You, which is something we add on to what we do in the Silver Core program of life system and intuition training. So here's my definition. Intuition, a bridge to your higher awareness, the part of you that rests on the foundation of all knowledge, all wisdom, all truth, all love, and infinite possibilities. It's a little bit wordy, and what I really mean to say there is what intuition seems to be is a bridge, and we want to create that bridge to our inner wisdom so that we have a higher degree of accuracy, a higher degree of reliability. A second quote that I would offer comes from John Holland, who's actually here from New England. As you know, I live in Connecticut. And I'm the director here in New England, so I teach classes in Boston and Connecticut, as well as Chicago. And John Holland is from New Hampshire, or living there, last I heard. In one of his books, he defined intuition as the language of the soul. We're all born aware with a profound sense of inner knowing. It's one of the greatest gifts we possess, which keeps us connected to our higher selves, the universe and to our divine spirit. What do you think? I think that's a pretty cool quote to look at. That's an amazing quote. I love it very much. And I do love the bridge to inner wisdom, how intuition is the bridge to inner wisdom. That really resonates with me very nicely. And and, and um, thank you. And, and the last one actually comes from Funk and Wagner's dictionary, their definition of intuition. A spontaneous phenomenon which cannot be contrived or forced. It is the act or faculty of knowing directly without the use of the rational process. That is a wonderful definition. How do you feel about that one, Ken? I kind of like that because, you know, this topic is still a bit controversial. Exactly. And, you know, as you know, in the Silver Method, we're not making a claim. You know, we have a speculation, if you will. It's our concept. And whether we want to be strictly scientific and look for peer-reviewed papers or metaphysical and everything in between, the one fact that remains that's undeniable is somehow, some way, we have access to a stream of consciousness, 
or information, thoughts, ideas that go beyond our physical senses, that goes beyond our rational thinking, if you will. So whatever we want to call it, ESP, intuition, there's so many terms lately. I think it's important because I think it will demystify this for people. And that's one of the first steps is to demystify and recognize that it's really just a part of our lives. And as Buckminster Fuller once said, it's, it's really like cosmic fishing. So in, in, in hindsight, real quickly, before we go into these principles, because this will make more sense, what we all want to do is honor what comes most natural to us. Meaning for some people, when they're getting intuitive insights, it'll be very visual. In parapsychology, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt you right there. Do you mean just like flashes of movie reels or just images? How do you how do you describe a visual a visual intuitive sense? Well, it's a skill set, and there's levels of development. And yes, for some people, like for example, my wife Barbara, she gets like a ticket tape. <laughs> Read out. Other people will get visual images, pictures like a dream, like a movie reel. And when we're getting information that's of a, whether it's highly developed or kind of vague, when it's of a visual picture, imagery, in parapsychology, it's called clairvoyance. And that's not the Hollywood version. It just simply means from the French, clear vision. And on, on the other hand, when people get like me, I'm a dominant kinesthetic. And when I first took silver, I didn't get any visuals. I mean, I would have been happy if my left pinky vibrated. I closed my eyes and it was dark, you know, and, and nothing was happening because I was worried. Then I started make, trying too hard. And I began to realize that for me, I was getting feelings in my gut, very common, the gut. Some people like Mark Waldman, the neuroscientist, calls it the second brain because our gut is loaded with um, brain cells, neurons, and Interesting enough for me, I'll often get feelings in my stomach or just a sense of knowing. And when you have those feelings or those vibes or that sense of knowing, that's usually called clairsentience, again meaning, not the Hollywood version, clear feelings. And some people are more auditory, meaning they hear like hearing a voice. And, you know, it's an inner voice, almost like they have a radio in their head and they're hearing messages, thoughts, ideas. And for many of us, while we're sleeping, we have that experience. And for others, even in their waking moments, they'll have that kind of experience. It's called clear audience or clear hearing. That's incredible, Ken. That's so important, I think, for our listeners, because oftentimes we get all these questions that are people concerned that they're not doing the techniques right or, oh, I'm not intuitive, I don't see those images or, oh, I'm not intuitive, I don't hear people telling me things. And it's really important that, and we're so grateful for to you that you're making these distinctions because you don't have to be all three to develop your intuition. Is that correct? Correct. Of course, Sarah Lee, in all these years, it's actually this May, Memorial Day weekend, I'm celebrating my 43rd year. I'm having um, a special class in Boston over the holiday weekend. And I'm laughing because those distinctions are so important because in all these years, I meet some people who seem to have it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're auditory, they're visual, and they're kinesthetic at the same time. Yeah, it, and it's fascinating to me. And it's hard sometimes not to be a little bit jealous of that. And and I know um, in our classes, um, Laura, your mom, and I have often talked about that, how so often we need to coach our participants in the class to honor and respect who you are and what comes most naturally. Because if we try too hard, it, it becomes an obstacle. It I creates resistance. Absolutely. And is there any sort of way, so if I, I'm a very visual person, if I wanted to develop um, a kinesthetic or an auditory skill to guide my intuition or to develop my intuition is are there exercises that we can do to develop those different aspects of intuition well yeah at the risk of of a small commercial that's exactly what we do in life system and intuition training it's step-by-step -step exercises that when you look at them for the memory pegs are excellent to practice with um, to improve visualization and also imagination the fantastic voyage the, even the sleep control technique to improve concentration. And especially when we get into day three, 
when we do the what we call the mental projection exercise as an intuition system, those are ideal. I've not, frankly, found anything to be as powerfully effective as those. However, you could stare at your car. You could look at your car, look at the color, look at the design, some of the details, and then walk away from it or close your eyes and remember what you saw. Right. You can do that with a work of art, and that would do the same thing. You could elicit emotion, feelings of, of love or appreciation for someone or something, and that will awaken the kinesthetic, you know, the feeling aspect. So those are little exercises that, you know, people can do that are very helpful with respect to that. Thank you so much for clarifying that for us, Ken. Do we want to continue with the 12 steps? Yeah, Yeah, I'm going to continue in. And I wanted to do that because it'll make much, when I go through these 12 steps and we'll go through them, you know, briefly, it'll make much more sense. So for example, as we move into the 12 steps, we're looking at influences, things that challenge us with it distortions, if you will, that contribute to it. So just briefly, within the domain of each of our life's experiences, we have an environment that we were raised in, that we live in, the people we associate with, the books we read. All this contributes the cultural conditioning. Our, all of this influences our belief systems, and that lends so much to why some people who, are more, who perhaps have been in an environment, a culture, where they've been encouraged. Like, for example, yourself. You've been in an environment and a culture your whole life, maybe more than you want even, that encourages paying attention, trusting, respecting your intuition, which is one of those principles. Secondly, uh, as we look at distortions of perception, there's things like, you know, ego gratification. Nobody likes to be wrong. You know, we want to be right, if you will. We don't want to be disappointed. And sometimes that gets in the way. We all have projections, for example, just in our relationships, for example, like in a romantic relationship or with a good friend or even with our parents. Sometimes we think we know what our friend is feeling or what they're thinking and we maybe put words in their mouth. That's called a projection. And it's the same thing with intuition that as we move through this, we need to be careful because that's called wishful thinking. You know, and that's a projection. And then, of course, fear, you know, fear of failure, fear of success plays into that because if fear takes over, the brain takes over survival level and it distorts the truth. So I, I say this because, you know, this is something we expand on greatly in the in the class. This is something that we all want to spend time privately exploring because it's it's rather complex. It's not that simple or straightforward. However, if we then look at these principles, these 12 principles, I intend, I hope, that we can all rely on to help us clear that path to our inner wisdom, you know, create that bridge. So you ready? Number one. Number one, I would say, is value and purpose. That we, and I think this is perhaps probably the single most important, that it's important that our values, our innermost values, what's important to us, who are the most important people, what are the most important concerns we have about life, about the environment, about our relationships. Whatever those values are, that each, and not right or wrong or good or bad values, it's important that those our, 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 our actions are, in, are consistent in alignment with those values. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion about having a clear intention and that intention is everything. It's a guiding force. Let me, may I give you an example? I would love an example. I was just going to ask you for one. So yes, please. Our listeners, I'm sure would love an example as well. Let me give you a a real world example. I mean, this is what I do. I started when I was 20 teaching Silva and I mean, I do have a life and involved, but this is my passion. I feel I was born to do this. And all these years, so the most relevant example I have is in our classes, when we do caseworking, which is a phenomenal exercise of intuition, we do that on the last day. On day number three in intuition, we do the, you know, the psychometry. What I've observed is that when a participant is in their ego of 
Can I do it? Do I want to do it? How accurate am I going to be? Or maybe they're working with somebody and they doesn't have too often, but they're kind of showing off like, look, look how psychic or intuitive I can be. That's a stumbling block. And I find that they create a lot of resistance and it turns it right off. They lose a lot of energy and their accuracy is not impressive at all. On the other hand, by comparison, when an individual says something like, and they're practicing, let's say, the case working, I don't know if I can do this, but you know, I'm working here, let's say, with you, Sarah. I'm working here with Sarah Lee, and she's got these cases, and I don't even know if I believe in absent healing or prayer healing, but she's such a nice person, and she's got these cases of people she's concerned about. If there's any way I could help them by bringing them into my laboratory level and projecting healing thoughts, if that's at all possible, boy, that would be so cool, and I'd sure like to do it. Right. That person is amazingly accurate, sometimes 100%. They nail it. I mean, it's it's impressive. They could start their own psychic friends network. <laughs> That's awesome. And for our listeners who don't know exactly what caseworking is, can you describe what that part of the Silva Method is? Sure. Um, caseworking serves two purposes. On the one level, it's, it's the oh wow of the class that is an incredible changing, limiting beliefs exercise, meaning even known intuitives. I have trance mediums in class, intuitives often, because they're not able to turn it on, turn it off. And when they get to the case working, even they have a little bit of apprehension. And they're also apprehensive, like, could everybody do it, you know, who's in, in the class? So on one level, the case working is an exercise to build confidence and certainty by giving us accurate points of reference to make distinctions when we're accurate, when we're not. And what's really behind it is our intention is our hope, it's our speculation that we can do something and help people, that we can do what's called absent healing. So the caseworking serves that purpose and each participant is asked to bring in with them, strictly confidential, real live individuals who are alive, who they know or know of, who have something wrong physically. And they're asked to sit down. Let's say you and I were doing this, Sarah. I would bring it in, as you know, uh, people I know, let's say relatives of mine. I ask you to enter your alpha level, your laboratory level that we develop in the class. And then once you're ready, I ask you to imagine on your mental screen this person, let's say my aunt, my aunt Mary. And you imagine her on your mental screen and you imagine what could be wrong. You don't know, objectively speaking, I do. And I then give you feedback, you know, yes or no. And with that feedback, you then begin to make distinctions about, because sometimes you blow it, you're way off. And sometimes you're right on the money. And most of the times people are in the middle. But I will say it's surprising how most people can be from 50 to 80% accurate. And I would say in almost every class, some participants really nail it. I mean, they're like, whoa, baby. I mean, they're like on air. So it's a process we use. Initially, the focus is building confidence, changing a limiting belief. However, our intention ultimately is to provide people with the skill of refining their intuition, developing confidence, and more importantly, opening a channel of what we call, again, our concept, our speculation, of subjective communication to somehow, some way, make a difference, even at a distance, and help somebody, and maybe make a difference in the world and the planet. That's fantastic. I love case working, and I love watching people, and especially those people who really nail it. They're so surprised with the amount of skill that they already have without even knowing it. It's incredible. Yeah, you know, next time I see we should practice some because I'm appreciating your enthusiasm. It's it's actually a lot of fun, too, once we get past, you know, the ego of can I do it? I mean, who cares? So if you're wrong, you're wrong. Exactly. But counts- and it's scary at first, but after that first time, it's smooth sailing from there. Yeah, and let me just add one other piece, just a, a little bit of history. One And this is important history because in the 1950s, when Jose Silva was alive and part of his research, when... His research subjects, you know, the 
affectionately we call them the guinea pigs, your aunts and uncles who are, who are being researched, you know, by your dad, by, excuse me, your granddad. When they began to sort of guess what he was about to ask them as if they were reading his mind, he thought, I want to something of more value than just memory improvement. And he began to study parapsychology. And a leading, a leading person in parapsychology here in the United States at the time was Dr. J.B. Ryan. And Dr. Ryan's wife wrote a book called ESP and Life in the Lab. And it's a long story, so I'll just abbreviate it. Basically, they found when they were testing people for, quote, ESP ability, intuitive ability, which I think is a nicer term, people would eventually who were be 80% accurate, but eventually they couldn't do it anymore. And he was using his ESP cards at the time, which you can buy in any shop. But then when he changed, and they thought, well, gee, maybe it was beginner's luck. And he went to another group, and the same thing happened. And another group, and the same thing happened. They would peak at about 80%, and then they would drop off like they couldn't do it anymore. He wasn't sure, but when he changed the experimental design and did something different, something more challenging, again, they would spike and peak at about 80% accuracy. And what he realized on reflection was they were bored. There was no value. It, you know, it was a fun game, but they did it so many times repeatedly that after a while there was no sense of urgency. Or excitement. <laughs> exactly. And that's the important distinction here is that I would invite our listeners, what's important to you in your life? Who are the people? Maybe in your business, decisions. How can it help you to maybe be more innovative or to come up with ideas or maybe to get to the truth of, you know, someone's telling you something. How do you know that it's really the truth? You know, you turn on the news media and depending on which news you watch, it's got a definite bias and an agenda. So it's important that we really refine this skill. And that's what I mean by having a sense of value and purpose. When that's there strong, that will propel us and help us to tolerate because you know, we can make it easier. However, it's not easy. And for anybody who says it's so easy, you know, a big red flag should go up. It takes time and practice. Not a lot, but it takes addressing it. Which leads me to, let's go on to number two. Great. Great. Unless you have another question. No, no, let's go on to number two. That was very clear. Thank you. Yeah, and just in, in, um, we have time. Number two, and some of this we've covered in the course of our conversation because you asked such great questions here, is... Number two, I'll call attention and practice. And what I mean by that is it's important that we pay attention. Like you, you you give this fun example of you're with your friends and you have this intuitive feeling or insight and you paid attention to it. And by the fact that you actually followed through and said something, you were practicing. I'm just going to interject here a second because that is so important. A lot of times, and I've experienced this with myself, I think or I feel or I see an image and I don't say anything because I'm scared to be wrong. And as soon as I over overrode that, it was like I was right most of the time. By just saying it and confirming it and really believing in myself, it made a whole world of a difference. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to say that. Oh. Oh, please do. This is great because you remind me. You externalized what intuition is very subjective and or non-physical. And that's why it's, it's um, controversial with the strict scientists. However, when you externalize it, you give it shape, you give it form, and it's also the quickest way to learn something. So you're acknowledging it and you're locking it in so that in the future, when you have that same feeling, you can say, mm-hmm, been there, done that. I know I can trust this. Exactly. And, 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 and again, that's what I mean. So you're making the time. I also recommend when I say practice is if you're a graduate of the silver program, remember you have a lifetime of free review privileges. You pay a small seat charge. Take advantage of that. It's continuous learning. It's like peeling layers of an, uh, uh, peeling layers of an, of a, of a, of an onion or you're going deeper, deepening your understanding. You're not going to come back for the material because you know it. You come back for the experience and the classes are experiential. And all those exercises are practicing. The caseworking, the memory pegs, all those different little things which will polish and fine tune. Making the time in a home study group or with family or friends. 
I mean, that's making setting aside special time in addition to just paying attention to everyday listening. Um, let me go on to number three. I, I could go on. I mean, I'm just flying in my head all sorts of examples because just like yourself too. You know, and I think everybody has had those moments that sometimes you wish you had listened or paid attention. And, and sometimes have those you're... moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that happened. And those are definitely the moments you want to pay attention to. I mean, both equally, don't you agree? Yes, because it's a point of reference. It's a, dis- a point of reference. There's a distinction between that. It's like, you know, you live in Texas, warm, sunny Texas. If I say, hey, you want to come visit in the winter and we're having a typical New England winter, well, if you know what that means, anyone who lives in New England knows when we have a typical winter, it can be cold and damp and sub-zero weather and ice. And we have points of reference because we live here. We've been through it. For someone who's never been up north or comes from a Caribbean island, they don't have that same point of reference. They don't have that same you know, experience. And with intuition, it's so important. I mean, we could spend the whole time just on that, couldn't we? Of course. So number three, third focusing principle, and this one, some would suggest, some intuitors, that this might be the most important or one of the most. It's certainly an intermediary step, relaxation, meaning allowing ourselves the time for some controlled relaxation through meditation, a nature walk, expressive dance where, you know, you get lost in the dance. I know you do. You come from a family of people who love to dance. That's one of the things I love about coming to Laredo when we have our instructor, when we used to have our, our conventions and conferences. And when you get lost in that moment of dance or, or movement or Tai Chi or listening to music that moves you, you know, touches your soul, what we're accessing is that inner silence. And interestingly enough, I know when I go for my walks, my workouts, often I'll have some profound ideas more so then than when I'm in a deep meditation. Not to take away from meditation, but you know what I mean. And and that's what, because people are so busy being busy. They're so distracted with emails and the phone and their clients and, you know, and, and all the demands in our, in our, in our lives that we need to take that time. And then people maybe have the time to get into bed, but then they fall asleep pretty quickly. So, Meditation, like we teach in the silver class, we call it actually dynamic meditation. Or it could be controlled relaxation or having a massage. But, I mean, how many times are you going to have a massage? Or going for a nature walk, expressive. These are all things that quiet our body, quiet the logic. Some would suggest it helps us access right brain type thinking. And we're more likely to then elicit an idea, an insight. In fact, let me, can I give you a quick example? We would love one, yes. I don't, know th- I don't know that it's a silver example, but to me, this is a really cool one. Sometime in the past, I, read, I was reading, in one of the, my readings research, I read a story about a businessman, an entrepreneur, you know, and so many entrepreneurs take silver, and I know you know so many very cool entrepreneurs, well, this entrepreneur who's always got ideas about business happens to be in the shower, which is another time to be quiet and, and reflect. And while he was in the shower, he had an idea, a spark for business idea. And his idea was for business to create a, a new business product, stuffed pandas. Hmm. You know, and as in the, as in the, um, the Chinese animal, it's their national animal. This goes way back a number of decades. Well, he was excited, felt great. He told his business partners, he told his investors, et cetera, and they poo-pooed the idea. Ah, you know, the teddy bears already got a corner on the market. We need another stuffed animal like we need a hole in the head. But he was stubborn. He just felt so strong about it. He sunk a lot of money on his own. He began to manufacture stuffed pandas and, you know, getting ready for it. And while he was doing that and creating his, you know, his business model, at the time, Richard Nixon was president. And Nixon went abroad to China. And those who know his, in, his, in history, it was a momentous time because he made friends with the Chinese dignitaries and government. And he brought back with him an interest in China and culture, in your Chinese culture. 
And that's their national animal. And almost overnight, especially in America, Americans tend to be very trendy. All of our major zoos were importing from China pandas. And guess what? Everybody his, wanted a stuffed panda. Right. And his business went through the roof and he made a small fortune. That one little idea, and that's why it's so important. That's all it takes is one idea and having the courage and the conviction to listen to that and to trust it, which goes on to number four, being honest and avoiding the self-biases that we talked before, of projection and wishful thinking or ego, you know, I got to be right, you know. Do you have a tip that we can use so when we're starting to feel these feelings of ego building, how we can tame it back a bit? Sure, I have more than a few tips. One um, that in, one that we can all do right now is, as you go into bed at night and you're going to sleep, is to review the day and acknowledge any, be appreciative of any successes, feel good, you know, celebrate it, and also acknowledge any setback or difficulty or mistake. Oh boy, I really blew that. You know, be honest. It takes honesty, and forgive yourself, and simply say, I give myself permission not to be perfect. That's great. I'll do better. I'll do better next time, and then, then go back in time, so to speak, to that event, and reframe it. Create like a new video of you acting more appropriately, trusting that intuition. And if you continually do that, you'll find that you'll notice on a day-to-day -day basis some noticeable, sometimes profound improvement. And that's what I mean by being honest. It's okay to be wrong. You make mistakes. You know, sometimes you hit all your marks and sometimes you blow it. We're all on this boat together. I don't know anybody who's perfect, who doesn't make a mistake. You know, if we, if we didn't have honesty and avoid those stuff, we'd have no innovations because innovators, entrepreneurs, they're high risk takers, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. As Buckminster Fuller once said, you got to be, dare to be naive. Let go of the pretenses. And that takes practice. And my second point is, as you said so beautifully, is that's what the silver training is all about. It's truly a training. It's not theory or intellectual stuff or, you know, wonderful stories. It's very step by step. And we're addressing all of that all throughout over four hours from nine in the morning to seven o'clock a day, you know, four days. We cover a lot of content, don't we? So may I go to number five? Just Absolutely. in watching. I mean, like I said earlier, some of this, we're going to spend more time with some because, you know, we really need a lot more time. And that's why I, I, I hope our listeners, if they're grads, they come back and review. And if you're new to Silver, make the time. It's a great investment or, or whatever it is that you do. I mean, you, you're that important. Give yourself that gift. Absolutely. And I do want to make sure that we have time for the exercise. If I'm correct, you're going to guide us through an exercise in a little bit, right? Correct. You know, help lock this in. Awesome. So let me just think briefly, because some of these we've covered. For example, number five would be cultivating receptivity and sensitivity. And that comes with the practice of making the time, trusting those insights, acknowledging them, paying That's attention. That's sort of what you mean by when you say the points of reference, correct? Correct. The points of reference, meaning, you know, I have a hunch, you know, I, I, I remember once I dropped... You may remember Ardeen Calloway, a dear friend who used to be a silver instructor. This is before cell phones were so small. And I had, I thought it was so cool. I had this big, you know, huge cell phone. You had to carry around mobile devices in my car. And I said, Hey, you want, I was dropping off at the airport. She'd been visiting me. You know, you want my, my number? She says, Oh, what do I need that for? I've got all your other numbers. And she's kind of a big girl. I used to be a flight attendant. I know my way around the airport. Okay, okay. But I couldn't shake it. I sat there after I dropped her off for like five minutes until the state trooper came and chased me away. I, 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 I had no conscious thought. It just something felt off. I'm driving away. It's a small airport here in Connecticut. I'm just getting on the interstate and my phone rings. It's my wife, Barbara saying, oh, Dean's calling, want you to come back and pick her up. They canceled a flight. There's going to be a six hours before the next flight. Wow. And I left. And, she would have, and it would have saved me time, too. It's, it's like, hmm, interesting. That became a point of reference. I didn't consciously know what the heck. I just, I kind of spontaneously said, hey, you want my number? Maybe I was just being cool. Mm -hmm. But then when that happened, I realized, hmm, that was like my inner radar sensing something. I can't explain it, but it's happened so many times. 
which leads into number six, which would be be playful, be childlike, make it a game, make it fun. It's not a test, a quiz. You know, you can do things with your kids. When we used to drive our boys, you, I know you know my boys, mm-hmm. and when they were younger, we were, and they were acting up in the back, I'd say, okay, let's play a game. I'm, Daddy's thinking of fruit. What am I thinking of? And they'd guess. And, you know, we just make a game of it. Or I'm thinking a thought. What am I thinking? And we, or we, or we're, we're in New York City going to a show or something and we're top, going to the top of the Empire State Building. And there's, oh, I don't know, like a dozen elevators. Okay. What do you think? Which elevator is going to come first? And we just make fun little games like that, which is also something we can do. It's not so relevant or meaningful, but it helps to awaken the ability. It helps to build up that trust. And that's really cool that you said that because even in the caseworking sessions during Sylvan Tuition System, it's kind of very playful. And, of course, we were doing some serious stuff and we're learning a lot of cool things, but it's a really fun to see people be correct in what, they, what they're what they sensing. And that's also very playful. So that's very, very important and super cool. Yeah, and you bring up a good point, and I would just say that um, you you know me to have – I think you know me to have at times a silly sense of humor. Okay. And I do that because, because I get so serious. I am, cause this is so important to me. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like you've been alive. So in the class, I purposely just make everything a game. I said, let's play a game. Let, okay. We're going to play a game. Let's do a game. And I find that the more we think like that, the more accurate people are, the more fun they have and the more fe- meaningful it is. And this leads to number seven, having trust and courage, following that first impression. Write that down, underline it, first impression, making it up. Every silver instructor in the world in a hundred and something countries has probably like a broken or skipping CD said, you may feel like you're making it up. It's that first impression. Trust it. And it takes courage and the courage will grow in time once, you know, you have a journal of successes. Again, points of reference. Number eight would be Self-acceptance, which we covered before, empathy, having a feeling of love and compassion for ourselves, for others, to want to make a difference, to do some good, to give ourselves permission not to be perfect, that, and, and, and honoring, maybe I'm visual, maybe I'm kinesthetic, maybe I'm auditory, who cares, however it's happening, to just allow it to just flow and to trust that. So meaning having a non-judgmental attitude It doesn't matter whether we're right or wrong, which is number nine, detachment. Detachment meaning it's okay to be wrong. You know, make it a be wrong actually, right? Because then you get to then you know when you're right. Yeah, that's brilliant, Sarah Lee. I mean, brilliant reminder. Exactly. Sometimes we learn more when we're wrong than when we're correct, because then we have the distinctions. Some (laughs) excellent, and that so just recognize. We do the best we know how to, we do the best we can do with what we have and nothing more. And when we have that attitude, then there's more of a flow because then there's less resistance. And when there's less resistance, we get more into the natural functioning. And it's, it's a natural process. It's just that we get in, we, um, get in our own way because of trying too hard. Mm-hmm. And number 10, I've said like uh, 10 times probably already, and you did too. Number 10, I call just a, Focus on it. Practice. Make the time. Um, depends on the age of our listeners, but if you've ever saw the the original Karate Kid movie, you know, wax on, wax off. Anyone who's studied martial arts, which is very complementary to Silva, knows that there are whole sorts of exercises you do which are not exciting, maybe even boring and repetitive. It's a repetitive motion that once we integrate it, it becomes a skill, and you go on automatic. And a lot of what we do in the silver method is is repetitive action, repetitive practice, and it doesn't take long. And once it's integrated, we've literally, we now know through science, created a new neural pathway. And once we have a new neural pathway, it becomes dominant, and then we go on automatic. It becomes our default setting, if you will. Frankly, most of us, we have a default setting just the opposite. So again, it's not quick fix, no quick fix here. 
However, it doesn't take your lifetime. I mean, we're always learning. But literally within a concentrated time of, let's say, 30 days to 90 days, we can make something more automatic where it becomes just part of our skill set. It's a lifestyle then after that. Exactly. Well put. Very well put. And number 11 is what you mentioned a dozen times again, right? Record your points of reference, the feelings, journal it, physically write them down, make notes so you can study them and certainly reflect on it. You have to spend a lot of time. It could be 30 seconds, just like you did. You mentioned before your example with your friends. You reflected on it. You noted it. And that's what I mean by recording it internally. And when you have a chance to record them externally, because then you have a record that you can turn to and say, hey, man, look at all these successes I've had. And sort there's of nothing like, an like intuition that. journal. Exactly. Thank you. Intuition journal. And the 12th principle would be, you know, everyone these days says we become who we spend most of our time with. Right. We become, you know, all the thought leaders are bringing this up. And we know that, you know, and that's what's good about a mastermind group or a home study group or having an accountability partner or a coach. You know, it's important that we spend time. And if we don't have it in our family and friends, that when we come into a silver class, we make a connection, with, which always happens, with some of the, our fellow students. And maybe by Skype, maybe by email, maybe we get together for coffee. You know, occasionally, it could be once a week, once a month, to practice, to encourage each other, to tell stories. Very important because... Having an accountability partner is a profound way to accelerate our, our growth spiritually, professionally, you know, personal development-wise. And also when it comes to developing intuition, it's important because we're not getting all that support typically, at least not yet, in the environment, in our culture as a whole. And we do this all the time with our friends anyways, like a workout buddy or a shopping buddy. We have this other person that we are accountable to. So this is just goes exactly what most people already do anyways. Exactly. And if I may say, too, it's, it's one of the things that I've always, you know, I've worked with the best of the best. You know, I've done all sorts of different modalities and trainings. And I always come back to silver. It's what I resonate with. I, I believe I've, I've been born to do this. And one of the things I, I mean, a little commercial that I appreciate about us is, is I see so many thought leaders that come and go. There's a new flavor of the month. And here we are 50 years almost later, still in the trenches with people, still in the communities, still offering our programs, still offering our support activities, you know, for those who are interested to work with that. And that's so important, more important than the initial training because it's what you build on with that. Yeah, absolutely. So, Sarah, what I propose is, I don't want to have an exercise, and it's something that people can model on their own. It's something that they can then, because I imagine they'll be able to access this whenever they want and listen and and, and enjoy it. And it's it's a way to, it's it's actually comes right out of our silver classes, is our program, as you know, we have information, techniques, and then we lock it in. Then we integrate it. Then we make it a part by entering a relaxed state, what we call alpha and theta. That's our concept. And then we, it's an accelerated learning approach. It's learning how to learn. And that's why we find that people learn so much faster. So I propose to do the same thing now that will, will, um, few slow deep breaths. We'll keep it simple, generic for people who have not yet been through the silver training. And then uh, I'll just call your attention to different parts of your body, encouraging you to relax. And then I'll ask you to review some past experiences you've had with your intuition. And I'll then remain quiet for like 30 seconds. And that helps to lock it in. That helps to bring it you know, clearly into your conscious awareness. You're paying attention to it. And then I'll go over these 12 focusing principles so that they will stand out and be more readily available to people. Again, we call that locking it in or making it a part of us. That sounds that sound? fantastic. I am super excited to to go through the guided meditation. Okay. Any other questions or things that you want to add? No, I think that you described it very well. What do you think will be the biggest takeaway from this guided meditation that you're about to to do with us? 
the relaxation component would be the biggest takeaway that no matter what they do with it, just anything that we take in the time, it's much easier when someone's guiding you in a meditation. I mean, the ideal is to do it on your own, of course. And that's what we want for people. However, some, it just gives you a focal point. It's frankly for everybody just easier. Second is paying attention to these focusing principles and now they'll have access to it. Although they've been, you know, everyone, you've been taking notes. However, just in case you'll have access to remind you of what you can do to fine tune your intuition. Because it's not something that we can just magically say, okay, you're an intuitive. Okay, you're better. I mean, yes, we can add that. What really counts is when we actually take action and do something with what we've learned. So that's my intention today is that to clarify things to do that will help you to awaken, refine, and further develop your intuition. That sounds fantastic. Let's do it. Okay. And I believe you're going to be using a sound. Can you describe to us what that would be like? Oh, yes. Thank you. The sound I was going to use is one that Jose Silva developed. It is, our, it is an auditory interpretation of alpha at 10 cycles. So again, um, we have tons, I mean literally tons of anecdotal evidence However, we do need more research on that specifically. So what it is is a repetitive, monotonous sound. And when something is repetitive and monotonous, people become, without realizing it, bored. And that boredom helps in that it helps us to relax. So when we incorporate the sound into a guided meditation, it it makes it easier. It accelerates the progress. So it's just a gentle tapping, tut, 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 tapping like that. And in the silver class, we use that. We use a theta sound. We use a binaural sound called the mind-directed sound. And if I might add is, I feel so privileged, by the way, to have worked with a pioneer in my observation and opinion, the man who really kind of started it all, Jose Silva. And he was using sounds back in the 1950s and developed these sounds. And now there's more and more research, I wish he were alive, that's documenting the value and the benefit of these kinds of sounds and these binaural sounds to aid. So it's very simple. It's you know not very complex. It's just a repetitive, monotonous sound. Awesome. Let's do it. Okay. So I recommend... Um, Please excuse the obvious, just in case, though, if you are listening to this, anybody in a car or while operating any machinery, that's a no-no. You want to wait so when it's safe for you to stop what you're doing and to close your eyelids in that instance. Know that I'm going to ask you to close your eyelids, and if at any time you want to open your eyelids, open them. You have full control. I'm just your guide. If you want to move, you can move. If If there's any noise outside, you'll hear it. You don't go deaf. It's okay. However, the sound helps so that when there is outside noise, for example, other than the sound of my voice, it gives you a relaxed focal point. So it's okay. Just acknowledge it and let it be. So the slow, deep breaths, what I'm going to ask you to do is, as you breathe slowly, is to inhale slowly through your nose as best you can. Hold it, I mean, very slowly, as if you were counting to seven, Hold it for a few seconds, count to three, and then exhale out the mouth. (sighs) And it's okay to make noise, like you're blowing out a candle, a candle that won't go out. (sighs) So none of this, (sighs) that's not an exhalation. (sighs) And just kind of a releasing, and just simply desire to relax. So please allow your eyelids to close. And with your eyelids closed, I'll put very quietly in the background... Very, very soft in the background, this gentle tapping of the alpha sound. We'll begin this exercise by allowing three slow, deep breaths. You may begin now by allowing a very slow, deep breath. Take your time. Hold it briefly. And while exhaling out your mouth... desire to relax. Just think to yourself, relax. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. Allow another deep breath. That's it. Very good. Hold it. Exhale. 
release any tensions, desire to relax. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. Allow another deep breath. Take your time. Very good. Slowly exhaling. Releasing any tensions as you allow your body, your brain, and your mind to relax more deeply than you were before. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. You can relax more deeply than you are now by simply focusing your attention on different parts of your body. You can relax your scalp. Relax your scalp. And allow this feeling of relaxation to flow slowly downward throughout your head as you begin to relax your scalp, your forehead, your eyelids, your face, your tongue, your throat and neck area. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. This feeling of relaxation continues to flow slowly down with throughout your body as you begin to relax your shoulders, arms and hands and your back. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. This feeling of relaxation continues to flow slowly down with throughout your body as you relax your chest and abdominal areas externally and internally. How good it feels to progressively relax deeper and deeper. This feeling of relaxation continues to flow slowly down with throughout your body as you relax your hips, your waist, your thighs, your knees, your calves, and your feet. How good it feels. It is a wonderful feeling to be deeply relaxed physically and mentally. You are now enjoying a deeper, more relaxed state of mind and body. You may repeat mentally after me a very simple affirmation quietly in the privacy of your own mind. Every day, in every way, I am getting better, better, and better. You may now take a moment to reflect on any of your prior intuitive hunches gut feelings, precognitive dream where you've dreamt about something before it happens, when you were accurate and you were correct, maybe was it a feeling? Was it a thought? Was it a sense of knowing? Was it a visual image? I will give you time to do this and remain quiet. When you next hear my voice, you will relax more deeply than you are now. You may now review some prior intuitive feelings, hunches, images when you are accurate and correct. Take your time. Excellent. Relax. Feel genuine appreciation. Allow yourself to feel genuine appreciation 
for being here at this time, for the opportunity to learn and to continue to grow and learn. And as you do, keep in mind the following information for your benefit, how to reawaken, refine, and further develop your natural intuitive abilities. Keep in mind 12 principles to help you focus your intuition for more breakthrough living. It is your opportunity to create a bridge to inner wisdom. <clears throat> Number one, be mindful of your value and purpose. Why is awakening and developing your intuition important to you? How will it help you improve the quality of your life, your family, your loved ones, or anyone or anything you care about? Take a moment now to briefly reflect on why is this important to you? What is the value? Number two, focusing principle. Be sure to pay attention and trust. Have the courage to be wrong. Dare to be naive and practice. The practice can come in the form of enjoying a nature walk, expressive dance or movement, paying it, or deep meditation like now. Paying attention to the inner silence, to those thoughts and ideas that invariably emerge as they relate to challenges, difficulties, projects you're working on. Number th three. We said it's your relaxation, inner silence. Remember to keep in mind your meditation. Your daily meditation is a natural bridge to awaken intuition. Number four, honesty, meaning avoid self-bias. Keep in mind that it's okay to make a mistake. We all have biases, distortions, whether it be wishful thinking, we call that a projection, or fear, fear of failure, we don't want to be wrong. Give yourself permission not to be perfect, and any time you make a mistake, acknowledge it, forgive yourself, and reframe it as if you were turning the clocks back, imagine yourself acting more appropriately, being more accurate. Number five, focusing principle. Cultivate a receptive, non-judgmental attitude and a receptivity, meaning make it fun. Think of the benefits, think of the value, how you might help others. And you do this with exercises like practicing the memory pegs, practicing caseworking, the Fantastic Voyage. These are exercises you develop in the silver training. Or practicing some of the things you mentioned, like looking at your car, studying its color, size and shape, closing your eyes, and remembering. This helps to cultivate a more receptive, non-judgmental attitude. Number six, focusing principle. Be playful, be childlike. Make it fun. Make it interesting. Number seven. Trust and courage. Meaning, follow your first impression. You may feel like you're making it up. Keep that in mind. That it's usually the first impressions when we feel like we're making it up that we're most correct. So 
Again, you're giving yourself permission not to be perfect. Allow yourself the space. Number eight, focusing principle. Cultivate a sense of self-acceptance and empathy, meaning honor your body, honor your own experience. If you're visual, trust it. If you're kinesthetic, trust it. If you're auditory, it doesn't matter. Embracing what is, recognize that some things are beyond our present control. Cultivate self-acceptance, a sense of self-love and compassion for ourselves, for others. Number nine, focusing principle, detachment. Again, the reminder is we all need to cultivate that sense of, it's a preference. Have a goal, have a preference. Be clear about your goals and state them as preferences. Recognizing that we're all on a path of development, spiritual development, personal development. Number 10, practice. It takes time to create new neural pathways. It takes time to go on automatic. So all the exercises that we've mentioned, as you practice with these exercises, it not only cultivates your imagination, awakens your intuition, it helps to put you on automatic. Read your journal, your intuition journal. Number 11, which relates to number 10, record these points of reference, these inner feelings and outer experiences you have. Acknowledge them, pay attention to them, and actually write them down. And number 12, enjoy the benefits of having an accountability partner, a support team, be part of a mastermind group. Spend increasingly more time with people in your life who will encourage and support you, people who you can talk more openly with. This helps to create this open attitude. All this information is now part of you and available to you. Anytime you need or desire to recall it, you will have quick and easy recall. Every time you study this material, you will deepen your understanding, further helping you to awaken and develop your intuition with a higher degree of accuracy and control. And keep in mind, have fun. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to five and cause a sound with my fingers. And at that moment, you may open your eyelids and be wide awake and alert, feeling fine and in excellent health, feeling better than before. Keeping in mind that the greatest discovery that you will ever make is the potential of your own mind. I will now count. One. Two. Coming out slowly now. Three. At the count of five, may open your eyelids, be wide awake and alert, feeling fine and in excellent health, feeling better than before. Four, five. Eyelids open, wide awake and alert, feeling much better than before. Thank you so much. I feel, like you said, completely relaxed. And throughout the process, not only was I feeling more and more relaxed, but it was so clear to me how easy and doable developing intuition can be. When you were listing out those points, it was so clear that everyone can do this. You know, I really appreciate you, Sarah Lee. And I thank you because you're interviewing the questions. Just what you just said now, these comments, that's exactly the take home that I want is that as you listen to it, it'll awaken clarity. It'll make it clearer and stronger. So I just want to encourage everybody, this is an exercise to do repeatedly, and it's very short and sweet to keep in mind. Do you have any advice for our listeners as to what they can do to get the most out of this meditation when they go home and practice? And how can they slowly wean off of the guided meditations and get to a point where they're doing this themselves? 
Okay, well, a couple of things. First is love and respect yourself enough that when it's time to do the guided meditation, close the door if you're in your bedroom or you're in your office, put your answering machine on, make it clear to family or anyone who's in where you are that this is time for you. It'll only be, what, 10, 15 minutes at the most. And ask them to honor that and respect that so that you're uninterrupted. Leave, turn your cell phone off or put it in another room so that you have, this is just time for you. Very important aspect. And of course, when you can close your eyelids. Um, the other thing as you work with it too, weaning yourself off of it, is the whole point of our program, the silver program, is self-sufficiency. However, here I am, I've been meditating for 43 years, once, twice, three times a day. I'm a practitioner of this myself. I'm far from perfect, and I still find it helpful at times, to listen to a guided meditation or have a sound. I frequently use, the, more frequently use the sound in the background, the alpha sound. So I want to say that it's okay. That's what it takes. However, as you practice it, after a while, you know it by heart. And once it becomes automatic, then it's less relevant to you. So it's kind of a natural process. And I don't know that I have a time frame other than to say that initially at first, I find that participants will rely more on their guided meditations of, let's say, the, a workshop they took or a silver, you know, seminar they took. But after a while, it might just be occasional use, once a month, maybe quarterly. And, and that's fine because it's just a matter of keeping it alive within you. Reinforcement, repetition is necessary. And neuroscience is reminding us of this, that it's how we learn And even once we learn it and we're on automatic, that if we don't have a constant auxiliary source of support and repetition, unfortunately, it's too easy to slip back into old patterns. And that's why I would say just do whatever it takes to get that reinforcement. That's great. Thank you for this, Ken. This has been such an amazing experience. And can you tell everyone a little bit more about what you have going on? Oh, sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, One is we're redesigning our website right now. However, it's still active and you can get information on me. Silver Method CT for Connecticut. Easy thing to remember is if you just Google Silver Method of Connecticut or Silver Method Massachusetts, I'll come right up there. And our website post schedules, you know, what's going on. So, for example, my first love is the original program, our core program, which we now call Silver Life System and Intuition Training. And I do both of them four days in a row called the four-day immersion experience. I do it in Chicago, right here in Connecticut, where I live. And I do it regularly also in Boston. So that would be posted on the schedule. I've got some coming up. We do them regularly. One of my other loves is I do a program called the Mastery Seminar, which is designed for graduates. It's my baby with Jose Silva's blessings when he was alive. And it's something that builds on the core program. It's something that helps grads take them to the next level. It's something that's a very honest, candid, deep look at what's holding us back. What are some of, some of the deeper, shall I say, hindrances, obstacles that get in the way? You know, once we're past the beginning stage, so to speak, and we've got a foundation to build on, And I've developed that to help graduates, like I said, take it to the next level and build it. And that I do all over the world. Sometimes I'm even invited to do the the core program in other countries. And that's usually posted on the schedule page also for my website. And of course, the Silver Method International website, my schedule will be posted there also. Absolutely. Yes. Please visit our website as well. It's www.silvamethod.com and you will find all of Ken's classes being posted. And I very, very much encourage our listeners to go visit you and one of your seminars. Ken, you are truly amazing. And it's been so much fun chatting with you. One of the things that I'm going to take away from this, from this interview is my new affirmation, which is I give myself permission not to be perfect. And I vow to you, and I'm going to make myself accountable to everybody, that I will say this before I go to bed at night because it's true. I do sit in bed and I reflect over my day, and sometimes my ego comes out and I feel a little bad about anything, any mistakes that I've made throughout the day. So I'm just going to remind myself that I give myself permission not to be perfect. That was amazing. It's been absolutely wonderful. We love you so much here. And I'm personally grateful to all of your contributions. And it's just been 
such a pleasure talking to you. And for all our listeners, and you want to find out more about Ken, please look him up on our website. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome.